Brian Avicenna, for me, is something away from the rat race of this world. Brian Avicenna is the beginning of the line and it's the end of the line. And in both cases, it is ripe for development. This area is important to me because of the memories, what the mines did to the family. Um, God's own country, really. Started here, then he went somewhere else. Out of the ordinary, once in a long while, just for the fun of it, and who knows where, ride from your home and arrive as a stranger, turn to a friend and be welcome there. The end of a line from the 19th century, a town of quarries and of age-old skills, the National Gallery was hidden in the caverns of Blynau, nestled in the mist of the hills. Now today we're back in Wales, having steamed through some of the most magnificent scenery in the British Isles. Out there lie the mountains, lakes and pastures of Snowdonia National Park. This is Blaenau Festiniog in Gwynedd, and what better way of arriving than on one of the world's oldest narrow-gauge passenger-carrying railways which came into existence more than 150 years ago. Now, I think I may need some help puzzling out where we are today, oh. Bob and Victoria. Uh, there we are. We're in North Wales, the far corner, about 13 miles away from the coast and Tramadoc Bay, on a parallel with Cheshire and Shropshire on the east, over the border into England, and over to the west is Ireland. And then north, although it's missing from our map, unfortunately, is Wednesday's big day out destination, the Isle of Man. This area in Blaenau is famous for water, slate and railways all three feature in an intertwined sort of way in the area's history. We'll be looking at all three on our big day out here. Well, mining, particularly slate, is the lifeblood of this town. It grew up on it and this railway was built because of it. Well, it still thrives today and supports a flourishing tourist industry. Now, all around us are lakes, reservoirs, waterways, um, the big dam, and that's hardly surprising because this is one of the wettest areas in Britain. Its rainfall is three times the national average. Imagine that. Well, despite its damp reputation, the sun has obviously kept a welcome on the hillside for us. This is, above all, the land of song, and later on, we'll be meeting the silver tenor of the Welsh mountain. And I'll be taking the plunge in the River Trewerin. I'll be doing some whitewater rafting. There's a chance, too, for you to win a Welsh weekend. The star prize on our phoning competition today is a luxury break for two at this castle hotel at the gateway to Snowdonia. Now, Blaenau is a community built on slate, and one man who knows more about that than most is former quarryman and journalist Ernest Jones. The town of Blaenau Festiniog owes its being to the slate quarry industry. It all started at the end of the 18th century and gradually grew throughout the last century until Blenheim Festinog had 4,000 quarrymen living here and in the outlying districts. The work was hard, dangerous, and there was a health hazard. Everybody worked for himself. At the turn of the century, one of the slate quarries of Carnarvonshire went on strike for three years. And that introduced tiles. Slate, one supreme, didn't hold the fort any longer. And that affected Blenheim immensely. Things went wrong. They emigrated in dozens, in hundreds. 25% of the people of one big area in Blenheim emigrated to America and Canada. There was an exodus of people from the quarries. Now, people who had lived all their lives in Blenheim had said, Blenheim will never see the closure of Tabernacle Church and the closure of Oakley Quarry. The Oakley Quarry, that's eternal. But Oakley Quarry did shut in 1970, all along the 1980s. We had lost all the chain shops, we had lost all the main shops. Generally speaking, the, the main street in Blenheim was a depressing sight. We thought, well, this is the end for Blenheim. But in the 1990s, these last three or four years, 
I have sensed something is happening in Vlena. We have turned a certain corner, I think. By today, Lina, to many people, is nothing more than a tourist center. Tourist attractions we have here have capitalized on the history and have capitalized on people's interest in the last century, in how people work, how people live, and they have reproduced with various ideas to tell them how Lina worked in the last century, but they do create interest and they do attract. The Festino Railway has come here again, which is very welcome. They have brought hundreds, thousands of visitors to Blenna. I don't remember ever being so optimistic about the future of Blenna as I am right now. I'm in Beth Gellet, and one of its most famous inhabitants for 40 years was a man called Alfred Edmies Bestall. And you're never going to guess in a million years whose stories he wrote and illustrated. In all of his games. You know, I think there are a few more thrilling sounds in this world than the voice of a top tenor. In the opera circles of Paris, Milan, and New York, people talk about the great names of the past, Caruso, Gili, Pavarotti, and argue about who was the greatest of them all. Well, around here, there's simply no contest. It's Glyn Williams, and he runs the local garage. Remarkable acoustics you've got in here. Yes, not bad, not bad at all. Have you ever considered taking up musical in the really professional sense? No, never. No, no, no. You couldn't oh, see I'm... yourself on the upper stage? I'd love to be there, but no, I, I couldn't do it. Um, reason being that I'm just a, an ordinary Welsh country lad who's enjoying his music, you know? Did yeah. you come from a musical background? Fairly. Nothing special. Very ordinary, actually, but... We were brought up through the chapel, the Sunday school, and Young Farmers Club. You know, you were acting, you were reciting, you were playing football, the lot, you know? A very Welsh upbringing. Very Welsh. Yeah. I had plenty of stage work with a choir, you know, but decided to have a go at competition work, and I won the, the Welsh National instead of about five times out of eight, and the, the International in Llangollen, and the Music Festival in Blackpool, all that, you know, where you meet the good tenors from all over the world. How much practice do you put in in a day? In a day, well, say five hours a week. You know, some days you rest, you don't sing, you know. I'm amateur, you see, so I can do as I like, you know. I don't sing. If I have something important on, I maybe not sing for two days. And what's it like when you're standing up on the stage and performing? What does it do for you? What do you get out of it? It's part, if you, you could compare, uh, if you were singing a top C, like in La Boheme, your tiny hand is frozen, La Boheme, and I get a good top C, or a B-flat in Nessun Dorma, for instance, um, it's like a golfer having a hole in one, you know? That's what it does to you, your adrenaline is there, you know? That's what it is.
everybody in Wales knows David of the White Rock. It's a, it's, it's a traditional Welsh song. And he was a bard who lived in this, just on the outskirts of this village. And um, the song is usually sung with a harp, where David will ask his family on his deathbed, bring me my harp so that I can play for you. The wonderful voice of Glyn Williams, accompanied by Gwenda Roberts on the harp. Now, a dog is a man's best friend, or so they say, but it seems that old adage was long forgotten by the star of the local legend that you're going to hear next on today's Big Day Out. It was the 13th century, a time of legends when heroes were abroad in the land. And Carnarvonshire, they lived a great prince called Llewellyn, who loved hunting. One day, savouring the chase, he summoned his pack of hounds, and all came save one, his favourite, Gellert, the dog he trusted above all others. Llewellyn had to go hunting without him. That night, on Llewellyn's return from the field, the great hound came bounding up, his mighty jaw dripping with blood. Llewellyn's heart froze with terror. Rushing into the nursery, he found the crib overturned and the walls splattered with gore. The dog, Gellert, had apparently killed Llewellyn's one-year-old son. Aghast, Llewellyn drew his sword and with one blow struck the dog down. In its death agony, there came the sound of a child crying. There, behind the crib, Llewellyn found his son unharmed and at his side the body of an enormous wolf, killed by the faithful Gellert. Stricken with remorse, Llewellyn carried the body of the dog outside the castle and there buried him so that all would know of his bravery and loyalty. It's said that Llewellyn never smiled again and to this day this place of tears is called Beth Gellert, the grave of Gellert. The world of high fashion might seem a million miles away from slate mining and blenai, but here in the town there's some young homespun talent weaving a very special kind of Welsh magic. Like many rural towns, Blaenau finds it difficult to keep its young people. Once they've left school, they drift away in search of jobs or further education. Mandy Williams studied design and fashion in Manchester and Africa. So what's brought her back? I came back because I feel happiest here. And I think if you're creating anything, that's very important. And I feel the environment here and the community aspect of it makes me feel happy and secure and therefore helps me with my work. I think the textures and the colours that you live with every day are bound to affect you, especially with the sheepskin collection. It started off that I did want a very masculine, heavy, mountaineering kind of theme. And it's sheepskin being a product from Wales as well, um, just added together and this long coat developed from the way the slates were stacked against each other, the colours, and um, I think it gave that masculine feel. The shorts and the waistcoat started out as a fun theme in a way. On the catwalk I feel it's important and it's a way of using 
um, a medium to promote things and it started out as a fun kind of outfit so the shorts out of sheepskin maybe isn't necessarily what you'd wear but it does draw attention to the collection and the buckles on the waistcoat keeps the mountaineering theme and it's a very strong image I feel. The short navy coat I feel this is something that from the collection that I can sell, I feel it's important that you don't just keep to a catwalk image. That's important to sell yourself, but then the navy coat was produced in mind to sell that image and a wearable image. The Summer 95 collection is based on a garden party theme. I haven't used sheepskin or the wools because I don't feel it lends itself well to a summer collection. This is out of silk. Um, it's getting to a more feminine feel because I feel fashion is going that way. Um, I'm trying to add certain colours to it through the embroidery work because I feel this beige and the cute colours have been going for so long now that at some point colour and pattern has to be introduced again. And this is why I've started embroidering onto the silk. As far as Welsh design goes, I feel there's definitely a basis there fabric-wise. But as for an image for the garments themselves, well, I'm working on that one. I'd like my collections eventually to be sold and seen on a catwalk. But that's in the future and I realise it's going to be a long-term plan. But that eventually is how I'd like to see my work displayed and sold. Deep in the heart of the Welsh hills, there's a harvest which glistens. Welsh gold has been prized since Roman times for its purity, while countless generations of English kings and queens have traditionally exchanged bands of gold mined at Dolgechli. In 1836, the first Festiniog train hauled its load of slate the 13 miles from Blaenau and the Welsh hills to Port Maddock on the coast. As the slate industry boomed, so did the Festiniog's fortunes, and in 1864, the passenger service steamed into business. But a series of strikes in the slate mines and the switch to new roofing materials were to sound the railway's death knell until its abrupt closure in 1946. Eight years later, steam enthusiasts began work on restoring the derelict line, and in May 1982, the final mile of track to Blaenau was reopened. The Festiniog railway has never looked back. My name's Gordon Rushton, I'm the general manager of the railway, that is to say I actually run the whole show and I came here in my mid-40s from a career in Sealink, having already spent some 25 years volunteering for the railway. And it's the volunteering aspect that make the railway so interesting because about half the staff here and half the hours worked are by volunteers. Not all of them steam enthusiasts, but a lot of them say, oh, well, we're not rail enthusiasts, we're Festiniog rail enthusiasts because of the unique blend of scenery, uh, social atmosphere, and the, uh, and the small railway itself, the small steam railway. I'm Jill Franklin from Southport, a housewife with two children. And for part of the season, I'm down here on the railway firing. Came here in 85 for a holiday. And then in 87, I started working. Start off as a cleaner and work your way to trainee fireman and then fireman. And then from then on, I will go on to past fireman eventually and then senior fireman even more eventually and even more eventually than that, driver, I hope. I just love steam engines. The sound of the chuff, the, the fact that you're actually doing the work yourself, making it do it, you know. My name's Helen Waters, I'm a transport consultant from Leeds and for two weeks every summer I come down and guard trains on the Festiniog. It's something different to do, I have a lot of friends down here and you get, I mean, what better way is there to spend your spare time? I'm David Parkin from Sheffield, um, I'm, a school tr I'm a school kid. Um, I'm down here for a week um, as a volunteer because I'm doing my Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme. Um, for a gold award you need to do a residential project where you work away, from, where you live away from home for a week. So I'm working on the railway. I really like the engines, um, but you need a lot more experience before you can work on the engines. Um, but every day when I finish work, I try and get myself um, a cab ride somewhere, maybe back across to work. But um, no, I don't know why I love them. Well, I like the smell a lot as well, um, the steam and the smoke.
While the narrow-gauge Festiniog Railway might be the world's smallest of its kind, adult volunteers are adamant that they're not just big kids playing at train sets. Morris Pinner. I suppose we could be accused of being grown men playing at trains, but I think really we're grown men playing as grown men because most grown men, I think, would love to play with steam locomotives. But remember, this is a professional railway and we do run it as such and we're not really playing. We're trying to maintain a professional setup here, running in a professional manner, but at the same time having some enjoyment. A quarter of a million passengers a year now use the railway, which is fully integrated into the British Rail network. For less than £20, the average family can make the round trip from Blenheim to Port Maddock on some of the oldest train carriages in the world. One of the people who comes to us comes from Basel uh, in uh, Switzerland, on the border between Germany and France and Switzerland. And uh, he's a teacher, and he comes over every year for his holidays, and he's learnt to drive steam engines, and he drives on our railway. And we have another person who comes to us from, uh, from deepest Germany, uh, who comes every year likewise for about three weeks to, to, to work on the Festinial Railway. We, we have people who come from far and wide, from America, from Australia, from New Zealand. It, it's a worldwide affair. One of the tremendous things about the Festinial Railway is that it's known worldwide. It's famous worldwide. It was the first narrow gauge railway in the world. And every three years, Blenheim becomes a steam mecca, where it plays host to steam trains, engines of every sort, and railway buffs from all over the world. a hike on a beautiful day like this in the mountains of Snowdonia would be a bit of a doddle really, just like going for a walk in a local park. But things can and do go wrong. You get to a bit like this and you think, why should I come out on my own? I can really do with a hand. Lucky. Thanks, John. Thanks very much, John. Oh, does that sort of thing happen very often on these yes, mountains? Yes, quite often. People getting stuck or off the footpaths. Or possibly one of the worst things is getting caught by bad weather. That They haven't sort of got the weather forecast before starting out. And then they get caught in cloud. They haven't got a map, they haven't got a compass. Or if they have them, sometimes people don't know how to use mm. them. And then the elements get hold of it all and, and they get sort of disorientated go down sort of difficult ways and then that leads to an accident. So what would you recommend that people come out to walk in? Well, uh, a good pair of boots with a tread pattern on them, uh, windproof sort of uh, clothing and showerproof sort of outer shell. So because unfortunately it rains here, a little rucksack that can carry a map, a compass, a whistle because if you do get into difficulties, then you can only shout for about 10 minutes and lose your voice where you can blow a whistle all night. Equipment doesn't mean everything. You've got to know how to use the map and compass, how to navigate. Uh, also, it helps when you, before you're starting out is to get the weather forecast for the area. Because when you set off from the car park, the weather can be very different at the summit, can't it? Absolutely. You get a four degree drop Fahrenheit in temperature for every thousand feet that you go up. Add to that the wind chill factor as well, so it's a different world, yes. Now, do you think there'll be a time when these come into play? They, they, we are uh, informed of incidents now with the mobile phones. The slight problem we have these days is that the cover in the mountains is a bit finicky. On top of a ridge, we get good communication. If people step down to one side, we lose them. 
So I think that they are good because once an accident occurs, the best thing is to, to inform the authorities as quickly as possible. And to get off the top of Snowdon in winter will take you two hours. So if you've got one of those, mm. you've obviously um, saved two hours for the patient. And uh, we get the information via the police. We decide accordingly, can we go up the track in the Land Rover? Do we call a helicopter? Whatever. But I think they're, they're good things. Obviously, some people are going to abuse the system with it. But what they must remember, it's at present, it's not a total cover in the mountains. So don't go thinking again that you've got one of those, that it's an instant rescue recipe. It's not. In fact, that could really lead to more disasters. It could be a false sense of security yeah, having yeah, this. Yeah. Now, how often do bad accidents happen? Are they a rarity or all too common? Well, I... Um, We'd like to think that with education and what we're talking about now, educating the public, it's rather good because on Snowdon itself, we have half a million people every year go up it. So we uh, probably we have about 30, 40 accidents that need people need to be rescued. And out of those, we probably have unfortunately about six fatalities. So on those figures, it's good, but overall, you know, any accident is bad news, really. So we are still trying to educate the public about the ways on the mountain and what they should be doing. Also, the number of accidents, the great majority, in fact, 80% of accidents occur to walkers rather than climbers. Is that so? Yeah, it is. So, so um, you know, in the media, it's ten, people tend to be called a mountain accident that happens to a climber. Yeah. In fact, it's to a walker. And also, you know, it's not a good thing to go walking by yourself. Um, you know, right. um, I know lots of people can't find people to go with, but um, if you have an accident, and unless you put a route card before you leave out, then heaven knows where you've gone. So it's best to go along with four people if you can at a time. Well, will you come with me, John? Pleasure. Lovely day. Let's get going. Blaine's quarrymen did much more than risk life and limb underground. During World War I, hundreds of them volunteered for Britain's only quarrymen's regiment, as this memorial to the dead will testify. But little did the town know that it would play a unique role in World War II when Hitler ordered his blitzkrieg on London. Late in the summer of 1940, a directive was issued that immediate steps be taken to find underground shelter for the National Gallery's collection. With the fall of France, it was decided by Churchill, with recommendations from Lloyd George, who knew the area, that uh, they would modify some of the chambers in the mine in Blaine Vesignon and keep the pictures there. They took about a year, nearly a year, to improvise and modify the chambers so that the pictures could be taken in fairly easily. One of their biggest problems was uh, access under a railway bridge um, to get to the Man of the Quarry. And they had to drop the street level, uh, the road level, by about two, two or three feet in order to get these big pictures under the bridge. Uh, as well as that, they had to drop the, t the pressures of the tyres <laughs> of the vehicles. It was decided to have a controlled atmosphere, so they would be controlling, they were controlling the humidity and the temperature um, day and night, right through the period that the chambers were occupied. Staffed by 14 men under a head attendant, the quarry was ready to safeguard the priceless works of Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Gainsborough, Constable, Turner, Renoir, Goya, Rembrandt, and many other famous names. The cannons were guarded day and night. Six buildings, each self-contained, in a quarter mile of Manor Quarry. 1,700 feet above sea level and along a very narrow winding country lane four miles from the village of Histinion. Well, the people of Blaine are new. Um, we had to be very ignorant not to kind of figure that one out because we're a very small community and uh, a lot of the people who uh, enlarged the, uh, the, the tunnels, the access tunnels, were local men because they had the skills. They had uh, guards uh, were, who were actually occupying the buildings 24 hours a day during the occupancy. After they were, uh, the, the chambers were emptied at the end of the war, then they had two or three local men looking after the place in perpetuity.
After coming across her old tango dress, curiosity had finally got the better of Lillian. Hello. Bravely, she'd come to the city to track down an agency called Love Roles, the role-playing specialists. Inside, to her astonishment, she'd found the young man who'd haunted her train journeys for the last few weeks. Once welcomed inside, the man introduced himself as one of the company's creative directors. A romantic pink brochure was at hand to explain the services that Love Rolls provided. Business for the passion boosters was booming, it seemed, as Lillian was left to read more while the young man took a call. Never in her life had she seen an office quite like this one. Lillian was both bewildered and impressed. Even her strangest Sorry. dreams had never been this bizarre. Before long, the young woman appeared, flanked by two very satisfied-looking customers. What on earth would Reg make of all this? Lillian shuddered to think. After seeing off her two previous customers, the young woman came forward and was introduced as the man's wife and business partner. She remembered Lillian, of course, and said it was nice seeing her again, as if all they'd done was meet in the supermarket. They all got comfy while Lillian nervously explained why she'd come to find out more about this so-called role-playing. They seemed to understand when Lillian said she didn't normally do this kind of thing. Patiently, they explained that their business was to provide ideas and costumes that might help put back that sparkle so often missing from long-term relationships. Since the company was new, he explained, they were still experimenting with ideas and had to test their viability, which is what they'd been doing each time Lillian came across them. After an extremely interesting talk, Lillian was shown some of the many costumes that the agency kept in stock for their clients. For Lillian, it was a revelation. Later, on her way home, Lillian felt a completely new intrigue in her train journey. She studied her fellow passengers. What were their secret fantasies? Were any of them role players? What costumes would they like to get into, given the chance? Back home, in her garden, Lillian remembered her own hidden fantasy, the thing she had wanted to try for years. So this, then, would be the day when Reg went off grey suits and Lillian... well... Almost 40 years ago, Raymond Garlick, the Anglo-Welsh poet who taught English here, was commissioned to write a, a poem about Blaenau. It's called Blaenau, I think, Observed. Um, and the poem concludes with these five lines, where he talks about catching a glimpse, not merely of a town notorious as the native place of rain, but of a stage for human history, superb as the theatre of Pericles. Poised amid peaks, we find our dignity. And when I think of Blenheim, it it is very much for me a sort of an amphitheatre and a stage, a backcloth of craggy mountains, and a sort of resonance in the underground quarries below it. And it's a remarkable story, actually. It's shared, by the way, by most uh, quarry areas in North Wales, Bethesda and the Nantley Vale, where you had an outpouring of very, 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 very um, rich uh, cultural expressions. The quarry industry has declined, obviously, and it's been turned now more or less into a museum, and people come here now from all parts of the world, not even to see a living industry, but to see what it was like once. That perhaps sums up our whole attitude. We tend to live 
in a past. I'm not saying that all quarrymen were poets or philosophers. God forbid, we can't have too many of them. But the general standard of their intelligence and their vision was remarkable. And Wales, I think, owes them a great debt. There is also a strange affinity between the landscape and the character of the people. I think the characters, like the mountains, outwardly are craggy, firm, uh, unyielding. But behind it all, there is a warmth and a deep, deep compassion, born out of pain, I think, and the fact that you were living from day to day with the possibility that you would not survive tomorrow. That sort of uh, anxiety has worked itself into its whole cultural pattern in its music and its poetry and this drama. I suspect that some of the contemporary problems spring out of an emptiness and a lack of direction. But hopefully, hopefully, there may be still down in these deep rocks something still a vein that can be worked, translated into new idioms and new forms. That is our hope, and that this sort of negative nihilism uh, is not the last word. Now our phoning competition, and today you could be off to North Wales for a relaxing weekend at the magnificent Rithin Castle. We're in one of Britain's most unusual villages. This is Port Merion, and although the buildings you can see around you may seem centuries old, if you'd have come here as recently as 70 years ago, there'd have been nothing here. Most of the buildings here were rescued from the bulldozer elsewhere. They were bought here brick by brick by the eccentric architect Sir Clough Williams Ellis. Now, the village really found fame a few years later in the 1960s, and then because of a TV programme. Typical. The TV show became a cult series. It starred Patrick McGowan. And today's question, it's really rather simple, is for you to name that television programme. I'll give you three choices. Is it one, The Saint, two, The Sweeney, or three, The Prisoner? Is the TV show The Saint, The Sweeney, or The Prisoner? Those are your three options once you've managed to work out for yourself. In which of those three Patrick McGowan said, I am not a number, you can call our number. It's 0891 114488. That's 0891 114488. The lines are open now and until 12 midnight. Good luck. Yesterday, we asked you to name England's smallest cathedral city at the foot of the Mendip Hills. The answer? Wells in Somerset. <laughs> Well, for some strange reason, Bob and Mo seem to have scarpered, and I'm here on my own at Canolvan Trewerin, the National Whitewater Centre, just a few miles outside Blaenau Festiniog. And I'm going to have a go at, guess what, whitewater rafting. There's only one word to describe this sport, exhilarating. The idea is simple, get from one end of the course to the other without falling in. Before being allowed out on the water, though, everyone is kitted out with safety equipment. Each group has an experienced guide who does his best to prepare you for the perils that lie ahead. Well, most of them. Here we go! The first part of the course is called the graveyard. That's encouraging. Travelling backwards is not recommended, but it's certainly great fun. And just because you're on a river, don't think you've escaped the old traffic jam. They're here too. Well, so far so good. We survived the graveyard, but there's a surprise round every bend. Oh no, it's that rock again. We dig in our heels and paddle hard. Phew. Everyone seems to have survived. A lull in the river and time for a breather. What do you think of it? It's good. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> You're all right in the middle there. Yeah, I don't have to paddle the right. I'm just taking the right. What's it like on the right side there? Well, it's interesting. Um, 
the actual power from each of the paddles, it doesn't seem to be doing much, but then you realise suddenly you go in the right direction, you know. Yes. What about when you're going backwards, though? Yeah, well, that was a funny feeling. It was much nicer going forward. Uh, going backwards, not so good. You can't see those bumps, no. can you? But you don't want to stop for too long. The waters are freezing. The chute is not for the faint-hearted. Believe me, it's far more scary than it looks. I don't know what's worse, tackling the white water or having the time to wonder what's round the next corner. Now, this is a wonderful river. What else do you do apart from whitewater rafting? Well, of course, really the main function of this centre here is to offer canoeing. And uh, we've had a couple of events recently of uh, enormous prestigious importance. We've had the World Cup of wild water racing at the end of August, just gone. And next year, we've got the World Championships of wild water racing coming up again the last week in August. Wild water racing, they start at the top of the river and they race all the way down to the bottom. It's about four or five miles and the winning time will be around 25 minutes. Because, of course, this river is regulated, isn't it? It is. It's regulated by the dam at the top. When the water's turned on, it's grade three and four, so that's really for intermediates and internationals only. When the water's turned off, you can walk across it in a pair of wellies. There's hardly any water in the bottom at all. Just enough for the fish. It looks so ferocious now, you can't imagine being able to walk across it. Oh, it just looks like a completely different place when there's no water release going on there. So, none of this would be here at all if it wasn't for the dam at the head of the river, which was built to regulate the fresh water supply to Merseyside. your aerobics, there's nothing quite like this for building up the biceps. A trip down the river costs you eight pounds. You could stand under a cold shower at home for less, but this is much more fun. And don't give me that old chestnut, I'm too old for this. Recently an 84-year-old took the plunge, and that was for a birthday treat. At last, safely back on terra firma, and we're all in one piece. But what's the verdict? It's very exhilarating. You, get, you know, you get really wet through, but it's really good. I really enjoyed it. I didn't really want to come, but I feel brilliant now I've come. They're really good. Madness. <laughs> Must be madness. It's just an exciting thing to do. Something I've never tried before, so why not? Give it a whirl. Try anything once. Tremendous! <laughs> oh, bloody hell! I tried to cover three times and didn't make it. Oh, it's great, this is. Enjoy this. A bit scary. You don't know if you're going to end up in the water and you're trying not to. I think more comes in the boat anyway, so <laughs> it doesn't really matter. I love it. The, the, the risk, you know, the bit of the danger. It's all here and it's a bit of fun. I mean, I just love it. Well, we survived, I got a rescue in, and it was really good fun. The only thing that's not fun is this cold water that just trickles down the back of your neck, but it was a great day out. Who's Mr. Train again, as usual? Oh, dear. <laughs> Anyhow, that's all from Blenheim Fastinion. We'll be back on Monday when we'll be visiting Nairn and Scotland. We'll be meeting some rather well-heeled hippies, what you might call the respectable face of the New Age Revolution. And we'll also be looking at the RAF Air Sea Rescue Teams, who help keep the ocean safe for the local fishermen and the men of the North Sea oil rigs. But before we go, I've got my souvenir, a traditional Welsh love spoon. And this tradition goes back to the medieval times when the men folk would carve these beautiful spoons for their sweethearts. They might carve a bell for a marriage or a vine for everlasting love. I've chosen a heart, which means my heart is yours. And I'm afraid, Bob, this is not yours. This is going to my betrothed. I must just explain that Victoria's getting married at the end of the series. And someone's been telling me, I don't know if it's true or not, but these little bumps represent children, so you better get stuck with funds. <laughs> Hundreds. Have a nice weekend. Join us on Monday. We leave you with the splendid voice of Lynn Williams singing La Donna Bye-bye. Oh, La Donna Mobile, qual pur mal veneto, muta la cento e ti pencero. Sempre amabile la giadro viso, in pianto riso e menso gelo. La donna è il mobile, qual più
Yeah. 